What is our anger trying to tell us? Anyone who is chronically angry will also experience physical changes in their body. That's because our body tells us what's important and what we need to attend to. If we ignore these messages from the body, then the body simply takes over and we collapse from hunger or fatigue. So anger is one of those things we can consider it here. Here we'll talk about it as if it's a symptom, right? Because that's that's uh, generally what it is, right? It's a symptom that something is not right or something's going wrong. So um, it it's important for us to look at those symptoms and to see where they're coming from and to see what exactly it's trying to tell us or what they indicate. It's like when you have other symptoms, right? Um, some type of pain in your body or something like that, then you know that it's important for you to go to the doctor and get checked out to find out what does that symptom mean? Is that symptom a, 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 a sign of something more serious? And do you need to get like immediate medical attention, for example? Anger is another kind of message from the body. It's the body's response to something it perceives as threatening. You may not even be consciously aware of the threat, but your body alerts you to the danger it perceives. And it does this so that you can step in and take urgent action to neutralize the danger. This is meant to be a defense mechanism. So again, um, it's a symptom to let us know that something's going on and that we should probably pay attention to it and do something about it. It is not always the big things that lead to eruptions of anger. Sometimes it's the little things going on all the time, losing a parking space, uh, getting stuck behind a slow driver on the freeway, stepping on broken glass, or accidentally dropping something on the floor, right? So these are obviously seemingly small issues, but we all get irritated by these things, right? And Usually, unless there's something else, you know, going on with us, something else bad going on with us, we don't get like in a complete rage over these things. Although sometimes if you are having an especially hard day or hard week, sometimes it's just these small things that might be the final straw that breaks the camel back. So you may act out uh, uh, on your anger due to some of these small issues. And that's why it's important, you know, that we pay attention to what's going on with us. We pay attention to the signs, you know, in, in, in the previous lessons, we talked about the uh, cues or the signs associated with anger, right? So it's important that we understand these signs and we pay attention to them and figure out exactly what do they mean to us. These are everyday stressors that overwhelm you and trigger your body's fight or flight response. The moment your body perceives a threat, the brain undergoes striking changes. Communication breaks down between the prefrontal cortex, where the rational thought and judgment resides, and the amygdala, where fear rules the day. Your brain gets pumped up on hormones like testosterone. So, and here, here it's important to mention also, so they talking about the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala. So the prefrontal cortex is where we make our rational decisions, where we reason things out and we make rational decisions. The uh, amygdala is, is basically the seat of fear, but it is also where the origin of anger, fear and anger as well. So um, the thing about it is that anger and I've mentioned it before that anger is one of our defense mechanisms, right? It's, it's our defense against feeling vulnerable. It's defense against vulnerability. So um, as you, as if you're in a, a state of fear for a long period of time, you will have a tendency to be, start becoming angry, right? Because who, who wants to be afraid and nobody likes to feel vulnerable. So you begin to become angry about the situation. And if you notice, or if you can remember a time where you did have some fear and you begin to become angry that fear begins to subside, right? As the anger increases, the fear decreases, which is the same reason that we, um, when we prepare for, let's say a, a, a competition or something like that, we get into our zone, we pump ourselves up for the competition. And you notice that the, the, the fear anticipation about it begins to 
subside as the as you begin to pump yourself up. And what do you do when you pump yourself up? It's similar to making yourself angry, not to an unreasonable degree, but you are actually making yourself angry. Technically, that's what you're doing. Um, we also have um, when we talk about uh, fear and anger and such, we also have what's called a fight or flight or what's commonly refers to as a fight or flight response. Now, I like to refer to it as the fight, flight, or freeze, right? And I'm not the one that made up fight, flight, or freeze. There are other people that talk about it as fight, flight, or freeze as well. But I choose to use fight, flight, or freeze because I think that is more accurate in describing what happens to us in these um, extreme situations. Because sometimes when we're presented or confronted with a situation, sometimes we will choose to stand our ground and fight. But sometimes we will uh decide that hey you know what flight is better you know maybe it's better to get the hell out of here and um live to fight another day but sometimes what ends up happening we may just freeze right and for a lot of people this is this can be very disturbing especially um for people who are basically known to uh have a high level of control over themselves or uh, consider themselves to be brave or courageous, such as uh, military uh, people, special forces and such, you know, or even even street people such as, uh, you know, gang members or thugs or what have you, right, can even get caught in a situation. And it is very disturbing when it happens, right, when you just freeze up, right? But just know that this happens and it could happen to anyone. But what's important is that we pay attention to these signs that we're having uh, 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 from our body. Also, it's important for us to learn how to relax, right? Relaxation is very important to our anger management, to us being able to properly manage our anger. One of the reasons relaxation is important, and it should be obvious, is that you are not going to be angry and relaxed at the same time. Self-explanatory, right? So if I can get myself to relax, then I'm not going to be angry. The issue is, how do I get myself to relax? And there are a number of different ways that people go about um, uh, finding relaxation. We have certain relaxation techniques such as uh, pr uh, progressive muscle relaxation, right? Or mindfulness meditation. And we have different things that we can use in order to help us to relax. But you have to find something that helps you to relax. It may be a a uh, a song. It may be a, a a certain friend that you talk to. But sometimes the music and or the friend may not be present when you're becoming angry. So it's helpful to have other tools as well that help you to relax. Um, visualization exercises are very helpful. So you may. Um, create a visualization exercise where you visualize this perfect, serene place that you have and, and you learn how to use that to trigger a relaxation response, right? So if you think about it, you have times that you can remember situations that happened in the past that are no longer um, affecting you. But when you remember these situations, it will trigger an anger response, right? You become angry all over again, even though the situation is gone and maybe in a distant past, but you still get angry over the situations just from the thought of it, right? And so this can happen in, re or we can use this in reverse, right? So we use this, this rela re relaxing scene or the thoughts of this relaxing scene to help us to relax um, when we find ourselves getting angry. So we definitely want to find uh, ways that we can relax. Uh, so then we talk about um, anger and, and the way we think uh, the thought process is associated with anger. And there are certain things that trigger us to um, get angry, such as um, uh, some people refer to them as cognitive distortions, and there are many cognitive distortions. I'm going to cover a few, right? Um, but there are many cognitive distortions that we can have, and and this is how we 
or when we're talking about cognitive distortions, these are are our tendencies to uh, think about things in a negative way, to interpret things in a most uh, negative way. And 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 the thing about it is the or these interpretations are not necessarily based on reality. <clears throat> Excuse me. How you interpret a situation determines what you feel about it. By the same token, what you feel about a situation in the past or excuse me, what you felt about a situation in the past will influence the way you interpret a similar situation in the future, even though the similarity might be slight. So this is the reason that sometimes we can be triggered by other people, uh, other people's actions or actions toward us or their response to us or maybe certain words that they say to us, right? So <clears throat> there may be something, a certain look that someone may give you and subconsciously, um, it reminds you of when, let's say, your 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 girlfriend cheated on you, or um, something you know, something bad that happened to you, right? It, it kind of triggers that, and that person has nothing to do with that situation, and they may not know anything about that situation, but your memory or your experience with that situation is causing you to correlate what this person is doing now to what someone else did then, right? Even though they're not necessarily uh, connected. For example, you become hypersensitive to signals of rejection. Then you may feel snubbed by someone as random, uh, snubbed by something as random and meaningless as two strangers having a conversation that doesn't include you. Right. So you think because these people are talking or having a conversation and, and worse, if they happen to be looking in your general direction, you automatically assume that they must be talking about you or they must be uh, making references to you when, in fact, the conversation has nothing to do with you. OK, uh, some of the cognitive distortions uh, will actually cover uh some of the uh cognitive distortion and again these these are just a few of the cognitive distortions there are uh, many right but again it's our um uh, erroneous thinking uh, all or nothing thinking so this is what uh sometimes people call this black and white thinking right thinking everything has got to be black or white this or that right and it's rarely that everything is black or white, right? It's, it's sometimes things are clear and sometimes things are not clear, right? So we got the, uh, the so-called gray areas, uh, if they, they say, right? So it says, uh, you see things in black or white. If a situation falls short of perfect, you see it as a total failure. When a, uh, so again, um, if it's not exactly or it's not ideal, your ideal situation or perfect, the perfect way that you want it, you don't see it as a success or you see it as a failure. The problem is that we are not perfect as human beings. We are not perfect. We um, can do things fine, even people that that um, have great accomplishments. Right. So when we talk about the Michael Jordans, the Cody, uh, Kobe Bryant's, the you know, the different people who do, who are at the top level of their profession, they are still not perfect, right? They still have problems. They still make mistakes. They still miss the shot sometimes, right? But that doesn't make them a failure, right? Nor does it make you a failure because um, you didn't get something exactly right the way that you wanted it. The thing about it is that you can continue to improve. Right. As long as you don't quit, as long as you don't give up over generalization. So, um, again, this is uh, something that a lot of us do a lot of time over generalization. So you might have someone, let's say um, your wife or your husband or maybe your children or something. Um, you're trying to get them to help uh, clean the yard, let's say. And they're like, oh, they want to go out. They want to go and do something else. And so you overgeneralize. You get mad 
and you overgeneralize the situation. Man, what's wrong with you? You never want to help. You never do anything around here. You're never helping. I always have to do everything. And this is not the case, right? It, it's not a case where that somebody never does anything or you always are the one that's doing it. Now, it may be often or it may even be most often that you happen to do it, but it's still not never and it's not always. And if I'm thinking never and always, then I'm going to be more angry than I'm going to be if I think that in uh, more in the terms of I wish they would help more often. Right. So I wish they would help more often is very different than they never do anything or they never help. Uh, mental filter. So, again, um, with the mental filter, what you what you will have a tendency to do is you will. Um, uh, you will take uh, a negative, like one negative point from a situation and you will take that to dwell on that negative point and you 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 fail to recognize or acknowledge all of the other um positive things that occurred in the situation right you can do it to yourself and you can do it to other people um discounting the positive and this is similar uh to what we do with the mental uh, mental filter right so you discount the positive in that um so, for example, and you could again, you could do it to yourself or you could do it to other people. So it may be a situation where, um, uh, you know, let's say you were helping someone to uh, work on their car, let's say. And, you know, you help them to, to, to get everything just about right or whatever. And, you know, in the process of doing something, maybe you're using an impact wrench or something like that. And you, you know, broke the the uh, the. Um, you know, you broke the, the, the nut, right? Or you broke something else on the, you know, maybe a, a line, you know, a, a line that runs the, the uh, liquids or whatever through the, through the vehicle and, and say, oh, man, and you know, and man, I just screwed up this person's car and you get all down on yourself because you made a mistake, right? You made a mistake and maybe you broke something that can be fixed, right? You can fix it. But instead of just thinking about, oh, you know, um, this was a mistake. And and while I uh, made a mistake here and this thing did get broken, I helped to fix all of this other stuff. Right. And, and sometimes the thing that's broken is a minor, a minor issue. You know, sometimes it could be big, but, you know, generally it's a minor issue and you just blow it out of proportion. Right. Jump into conclusions. So this, again, is something that all of us uh will do from time to time where we uh jump to conclusions as to what somebody's intentions are and and generally we're jumping to conclusions in a negative way and and two ways that we jump to conclusion that they refer to are mind reading and fortune telling about mind reading it says um without checking it out you arbitrarily conclude that someone is reacting to you negatively so again you see someone, maybe they make a certain face, you know, a cyber glance or whatever, and you automatically assume one that that glance is is in reference to you, and two that that glance is, um, you know, some negative thought that they're having about you, right? Or fortune telling. Uh, you predict that things will turn out badly um, before a test. You t uh, you you know. Or something like that. You you just automatically um, uh, see that things are going to turn out badly, or maybe you wake up in the morning and you know something goes wrong, and and you're like, Fuck, man, I already know this is going to be a bad day, and you automatically assume that it's going to be a bad day, and so as you go through your day, you're looking for something to go wrong because you already told yourself something's going to go wrong. So you know that something's bad is going to happen. You're just waiting for the other shoe to drop. The problem is that when we um, start looking for something bad to happen, ultimately at some point it may happen or it will happen, right? Not because it necessarily was going to happen, but we will begin to take actions that lead us towards that bad thing happening, right? 
Um, this this uh, reminds me of, you know, what people talk about. When we talk about self-fulfilling prophecies. Right. So when we talk about um, things like self-fulfilling prophecies, this is us um, predicting that we're going to be, let's say, a failure, for example. Right. So if I'm already thinking negatively and thinking that I'm going to be a failure, then what ends up happening is I tend to take actions that leads towards me being a failure. And then when it actually happens, you know, I don't think about the fact that that I um, negatively that that my thought patterns led me to behaviors that negative uh, negatively affected my outcome. What I think is that, you know, there it goes. I just knew it was going to happen. Right. And it's not necessarily so. Magnification, you exaggerate the importance of your problems and shortcomings or you minimize the importance of your desirable qualities. And a lot of us do this, and this is a, 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 a real self-esteem issue, right? Um, if we have uh, low self-esteem, it's very difficult for us to see the, the utility or, or the benefit in the things that we do for people in the ways that we help people, but we will have a, uh, we will, we will, magnify the the wrong right the problems the the negative side of it will magnify but will discount the positive and this is not helpful it's not helpful to magnify uh something that we do wrong nor is it helpful to to discount uh when we do something good we also don't want to discount when we do something wrong we take responsibility for it and then we correct it emotional re reasoning you assume that your negative emotions necessarily reflect reality. So again, you have certain feelings or, you know, certain negative emotions going on where you feel negative about something and you just assume that that's the way the world is or that's the way that things are necessarily going to play out because you feel that way. Um, should statements. So these are or the should, what people should do or shouldn't do or can't do or stuff like that, right? So what's problematic about this, right? So, and, and we all have these ideas about the way that people should act, right? It's part of our value system, the way that we should conduct ourselves in the community or the way that we should speak to people and stuff like that, right? The problem with the shoulds is that we all have different value systems, right? Some of us will have similar values and and there are some things that are considered to be norms or or common um, acceptable practices or what have you. Right. But when I'm thinking or when I place my values on someone else, then I'm generally going to be upset when their behavior don't meet my um, uh, my expectations. Right. The problem is that they're behaviors are not supposed to meet my expectations. Their behaviors are supposed to meet their value system and their expectations, right? And if I have a problem with what they're doing, or I believe that they're violating my rights, then I can have a reasonable discussion with them. And then we can try to reach some type of compromise, but they're not supposed to walk around trying to please me, nor am I supposed to walk around trying to please them. Labeling. Labeling is an extreme form of all of nothing thinking. Instead of saying, I made a mistake, you attach a negative label to yourself, like I'm a loser or I'm stupid or I'm a failure or something like that. And you don't want to do that. The thing about um, labeling and when we're using, especially when we're using these negative labels for ourselves, is, is that we begin to internalize these labels as if they are facts. Right. So like me saying I'm a loser, or I'm a failure or whatever. And, and I begin to internalize these things. And, and it's similar to affirmations. Right. So when we talk about affirmations or positive affirmations, um, that's one of the ways or one of the suggestions that people talk about for people to help them improve their self-esteem. And there are other things that you need to do. Just uh, reciting some affirmations in and of themselves or by themselves is. I guess it could be somewhat helpful, but it's not going to be as helpful as if you actually take action. But again, you begin to internalize these messages that you're giving yourself. And so if I'm constantly telling myself that I'm a loser, I'm a failure, 
then I feel like a loser or, or, or and, and or a failure. And I'm not going to be very motivated to do things that are going to help me to be successful in life because why would I? I'm a failure. I'm a loser, right? Um, that is my lot in life. And that's not actually what the case is, but I, I'm constantly giving myself these negative messages. So I begin to act in that way. Uh, personalization and blame. Personalization occurs when you hold yourself personally responsible for an event that isn't entirely under your control. And some people do the opposite. They blame other people or their circumstances for their problems and they overlook the ways that they might be contributing to the problem. And, and this is actually really important um, when we're talking about the personalization and blame because we don't want to do either one of these to an extreme and we want to be somewhere um, in between. So again, uh, you know, you don't hold yourself completely responsible for a situation that is not entirely under your control, but you also don't blame other people for the problems that you're having. Now, as far as the first part of this, I actually um, have some advice that I usually give people in an anger management context and then just in the context of life in general, um, that when something happens or you're upset about something or you feel that something goes wrong with you, and especially when it's um, your interaction with another person, I generally say to look at how you may be responsible. And what I mean by that, again, it's not that you're totally holding yourself accountable and you're beating yourself up because you made the situation go bad. No, what I'm what I'm saying is you figure out how some of your behavior could have contributed to the problem. Right. And 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 the reason why I encourage people to do this is because if you can figure out how your behavior or something about your behavior contributed to the problem, you may be able to adjust that behavior, which in the future will change the whole outcome of the situation, right? Again, the other person may have done things. So maybe you've done some small, uh, seemingly insignificant thing, and the other person may be mostly at fault. Maybe they assaulted you, which they never are, are justified in doing, or they did something else um, that caused uh, problems for you, right? But the small action that you took played some part. And, and, and when you change that, right, maybe you never get involved in a situation with the person in the first place, right? So if you can change that, then you change the whole situation. That's why I encourage people to figure out how you could have played a part. And again, it's not about just blaming yourself without um, looking at or trying to reach some type of uh, beneficial um, understanding about the situation. This is um, uh, very important, yeah. right? So, you know, we want to um, take all of these things into consideration. Anger management um, is a lifelong process, right? Especially for those that of those of us that have severe anger issues, but even people that haven't or that don't believe that they have anger issues, I think that they sometimes could be even more vulnerable than the people that have severe anger issues or that are known to have severe anger issues. Because if I know that I have an anger issue, then I know that I need to be careful about my anger and how I um, choose to deal with situations but if I am not uh, conscious that I have anger issues, then I become more vulnerable uh, to the fact that I may react to a situation. So a, a person that has never had an uh, anger issue before, let's say, um, generally these are the people that end up being, let's say, the school shooters or the people that run up in the theaters and stuff like that. And sometimes when people go in and they look at these people history, they did not necessarily have a bad history. Sometimes, sometimes they did. And sometimes there were clear signs that this person was going to act out badly. But in a lot of cases, there's, there are no clear signs that this person 
was going to act out and everybody is surprised, right? Because a lot of times what ends up happening is the person will um, hold in their anger for so long, they stuff it down, they never um, process it. And so at some point, they just snap, right? It's uh, similar to a tea kettle, right? So the old tea kettles, you would sit them on a stove and you heat up the, the water in a tea kettle. So what happens, right? Over time, as the water continues to heat up, you begin to hear a, a whistle from the tea kettle, right? And that whistle is letting you know that the water is hot. And why is it a whistle? It's not just a, a, a whistle. What's actually happening is there's pressure that's coming from the steam in the tea kettle that begins to make, uh, as the water begins to boil, and then it begins to whistle because the pressure is coming out of, uh, of the pot. And, and that's similar to the pressure that's on us from our anger. So we have to learn to manage these things in the appropriate manner. And that's why we are encouraged, if we have anger management issues, to find ways that we can relax, to definitely find ways that we can process the anger in a healthy way that doesn't cause us to um, get in trouble and cause problems for our life and our health. So anyway, um, we are going to get to the next lesson.